preparing a place, reaching for souls. Thank God. It's clear that many of us need a fresh passion for souls. Thank God. We need a fresh passion to get a hold of our hearts that we need to re Five ourselves, and if you've had the Holy Ghost for many years, you need to remember back when you first got the Holy Ghost. At first, especially if you weren't brought up in Pentecost. Those of you that were brought into the church, when you came into this thing, I'm telling you, it was like a lightning. It was like a transformation. It was like, hey, I got to go tell somebody about what happened to me. I realize that sometimes when you're brought up in the church, like some of us, thank God that, that you don't get that quite that impact when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're just doing what I need to do. Praise God. But I'm telling you, it's always exciting to watch someone that hadn't been brought up in church. And when they get the Holy Ghost, it, it affects their world. Praise God. Their whole world gets shook up by it because they, they know that, hey, something's happened to you. Thank God. Some of them put a timetable on and say, well, about two weeks, he'll be back to doing old things and all of that. But the truth of the matter is, if you get the real thing, praise God, there's nothing to go back to. There's no desire to go back. Thank God, because that's where it's at. Praise God. So tonight, my challenge is I'm trying to break up that complacent heart. I'm trying to break up that one that's kind of got an ease in Zion. Thank God, I just feel like that I'm just going to try to coast it on in. I'm telling you, it's an uphill climb. You can't coast to heaven. Praise God. So don't be looking for a place to let up. Thank God, it's really forward. Thank God, it's give it everything you got because we haven't made it until those pearly gates click behind us. And so I'm not going to... Let up. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to look back. I'm going to keep pushing forward because that's where it's all about. Because if we, thank God, are to be a part of that end time revival. And that's the, I'm telling you, there is an end time revival. God's going to give it to this world. He's already promised it. But the truth of the matter is, is that you may not be a part of it. Praise God. You don't just accidentally get the end time revival. If you want to be a part of end time revival, thank God, you're going to have to understand. Thank God, I'm going to have to break up some fallow ground. Thank God, I'm can't be at ease in Zion. I can't just be trying to take the easy road and say, well, somebody else will do it. Thank God. I want to be in the middle of whatever's being done because that's where God's going to bless. Thank God. We need to understand there is no good ground left. Thank God. I'm telling you, a lot of folks are waiting for some good ground and find somebody good enough that it looks like they would make a good saint of God. Thank God. But we have to understand the harvest that we've been given to give, thank God, is on fallow ground. And we're going to have to break up the fallow ground. There are no good people left to reach with the gospel. Thank God. The good people have already got their religion. Thank God. They've already found their little niche. Thank God. They are already content in whatever they have to do. Thank God. They are a part of what the Bible calls the end time ch church in the world is the Laodicean church. You know, there's two churches at the end time, and that's the Philadelphian church, and that's the Laodicean church. The Philadelphian church is a church that he says, I got an open door before you that no man can shut. And if you want to, thank God, I'm going to give you a little space of time that you can walk through that door. But there's another church out there. It's called the Laodicean church. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that's content to be in Laodicea. This is Laodicea, verse 17 and 18 of Revelation. It says it like this. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and oh, miserable yes. and poor and blind Praise and naked. Oh, yes. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness doth not appear. And anoint thine eyes with our sad. Oh, yes. That thou I mayest see. see. Thank God. So they are content. Thank God. They have learned how to have church. And Jesus don't even have to show up. Matter of fact, uh, Jesus is on the outside. And he's trying to get on the inside. The verse goes on to say it like this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If come any on. man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and be he with me. Praise God. And I want you to understand there's still hope for that church out there, but it's not an easy place to go to try to reach. The hardest people to reach are people that uh, already feel like they're saved. Hang on. Saved people are hard to reach with the gospel. They are content with their religion. They're content with what they have. Thank God. Even when Jesus came, he could not reach the good people of his day. Thank God. The good people of his day was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Thank God. They had religion under control. They knew how to have 
church. They knew how to have religion. Thank God. They were the religious people of that day. Matter of fact, they're the ones that crucified Jesus. They're the ones that said, hey, thank God, he's rocking our boat too much. He's upsetting our little apple cart too much. And so they were the ones that had Jesus crucified. So Jesus, when he began his ministry, thank God, he reached for the sinner. He reached for the tax collector. He reached for the street walker. Thank God, Jesus was reaching for the outcast of his day. And I'm telling you, it hasn't changed today. Thank God, if we're to reach the world, we're going to have to just reach, thank God, the hard ones. Thank God, that one that has a hopeless situation. So what do you what do you do when there's no good people left to do? You do what Jesus did. Thank God you reach for the sinner. Thank God you reach for the down and outer. Thank God you break up that fallow ground. Thank God you go in the highways and the byways and you compel them to come in. Jesus said it's the sick that need the physician. Jesus said it's the sinner that needs a savior. Jesus said it's the down and out that need a hand up. Praise God. Jesus said the losers need to be on the winner's team. And so he invited them to join up with him. Thank God. Now, the follow, follow ground can be good soil. Thank God. It just needs to be broken up. It just never has had a chance to see what it could really be. Matter of fact, there's some of you sitting here today. Thank God that used to be fallow ground. Praise God. You surprised yourself of what God has done with you. And he ain't through yet. He can do a whole lot more. So just understand. Thank God. Don't ever qualify anybody because I'm telling you, it's no telling what God can do. Thank God. Some of the early preachers couldn't even read or anything. Thank God. But they'd pick this Bible up and they could read the Bible. They couldn't even read anything else, but they could pick the Bible up and they could read it. And they preached and there were some great ministers of the early days. Thank God. There were people that never had played a piano and things, but after they got the Holy Ghost, they just sat down and they just started playing. Thank God, because God needed a piano player. And so he just raised up one. And so I'm telling you, there is a God that can do something good with some fallow ground. And so don't ever underestimate that soul that you're trying to reach for. Thank God we are aware of the parable that Jesus gave about the banquet that was the invitations were given out and the guests were invited. The good guests were invited. Thank God the good ones were invited to come. Thank God. But this is what happened to them. Verse number 21 of Luke, it says it like this. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Praise God. And so the first invitation went out. They didn't want it. They, they had their own thing going. Praise God. They were the good ground. They were the good guests that he had really wanted to come, but they didn't want to come. And so he said, look, just go out and get somebody to come. Give them. We're going to write up a bunch of new invitations. And give out all these invitations to whoever wants to come. And so they went out. They gave out all these good invitations. Hey, come up to the king's house. Thank God. He's got a big banquet spread. It's free. All you got to do is come on up to the king's house. And then uh, his servants came back after they had gave away all these free invitations. Verse number 22, he said this. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Thank God. And so he said, hey, wait a minute. Thank God, I want my house to be filled. Thank God. God wants his church to be filled. Praise God. You might say, well, we, we went out and we did a little bit and we got a few to come. And, and so here we are, Lord. Are you satisfied? Oh, no. We got to have a full house. Praise God. And so he said, look, I want you to go again. But this time, don't take an invitation. Thank God. This time, I want you to go out there and you're going to compel them to come in. Thank God. You can say, hey, you got to come. Praise God. And so it was in verse number 23, he said it like this. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges. And compel them to come in that my house may, may be, be filled. filled. Thank God. Look, we are that third stage of invitation. We're living in that third stage of invitation. Thank God. We have to understand it's time to compel them to come in. Thank God. And you know, sometimes we think about compelling. You know, you could get a gun and compel them to come and all kind of things. But really and truly, that was not the way that he wanted you to compel them. Thank God. No doubt they had heard that first invitation. No doubt they were out there. All those invitations, they were trying to get anybody to come. Hey, come on, come on, here, here, here's your invitation. But they, they shied away from it because they felt like, hey, I'm unworthy. Thank God, I, I could never go up to the king's house. My Lord, he wouldn't want somebody like me at his house. Thank God. So they, they rejected that invitation. Thank God, he wouldn't want me to be there. Man, I'm bad. Praise God, I've got all kind of bad things on my record. I mean, he wouldn't want me there. Praise God. So they disqualified themselves. Thank God. I, I, 
I don't have anything to wear to the king's house. Praise God, what would I wear to the king's house? Thank God, they didn't know. Thank God, the king had already taken care of that. Hey, I got a garment for you. You just get there. I can take care of you. Praise God. You don't have to anything. Thank God. We need to let them know, thank God, that they can come. Thank God that the king has a, a new garment for them. So who do you really, how do you really compel people to come in? Thank God, the first thing you have to do, thank God, is you got to love God. Thank God, you need to see, they need to see the love of God. Thank God, you know, you can tell them about Jesus, but they'd rather see Jesus. Thank God, and when they start seeing Jesus, then they want you to tell them about that Jesus that you have seen. And so, love is the thing that we've got to understand. We've got to go out there and start loving the world. We've got to do whatever. Thank God, they may have, they may need a helping hand. Thank God, they may have some problems, and you may have to sit down and say, hey, I know one that can solve that problem. Thank God. And sometimes it may be a problem that you can solve. You know, maybe they need some spark plugs, or maybe they need, thank God, somebody to fix a flat tire, or maybe they just need somebody to invite them over for supper or something. You know, but I'm telling you, we need to let them know that, hey, this love that we have, thank God, it makes you care about other people. It makes you want to do for other people. Thank God. And so they need to see it in action. Thank God. They, we need to back it up. You know, and so that's part of it. Thank God. The second thing is they need the word of God. Praise God. They need the love of God to be showed to them. They need the word of God to be shared with them. And so every chance we get, we need to be telling them about what Jesus said. We need to be telling them about, hey, Jesus got an answer for that. Jesus is your solution. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus loves you. Thank God. Jesus can help you. Jesus can heal you. Jesus can do whatever you need him to do. Thank God. And then the last thing, they need to feel the power of God. When they walk into church, thank God, they need to feel the power of God. Thank God. It's not just something we tell you about. It's something you can feel. Praise God. And so it's, it's the love. Thank God. And so it's love. It's the word. Thank God. And it is, thank God, the power of God unto salvation. And so somewhere we need to let them know, thank God, they need to hear the word. Thank God, they need to feel the power of God. So there are three things that you have to do to, to break up that fallow ground. Thank God, you have to love them where when they are unlovable. Thank God, you have to take the word of God to them. Thank God, and you have to let them see the power of God and what it can do. And sometimes a testimony of the power of God is a wonderful thing. And when they come... Thank God, and find the real thing. Thank God, they're not going to be uh, worried about going back. Thank God, they're, you know, and the amazing thing is a lot of us, and it's sad to say, thank God, we come into the banquet house of the Lord. Thank God, the table is spread. Thank God, and, and you know, they, they serve the, the, the new wine, not, not wine, new wine, praise God. You know, we just take a little sip. Thank God, we're just, you know, social drinkers now. Praise God, well, I got a little blessing here. Thank God, just give me a little, just give me a little of that over there. And, you know, just kind of social. But I'm telling you, when you get these folks that had never sat down at the king's table, thank God, they got that wedding going on. Thank God, they're qualified. Praise God. And they say, hey, pass me that jug over there. Praise God. They just kind of turn that new wine up. Praise God. They just grab a hold of that plate. Praise God. Now, I'm telling you, their table manners not, may not always be real pretty, but I'm telling you, these new people, when they come in here, you might as well get ready. We may have a few holes in the sheetrock. That'll be okay. Thank God. Sometimes they don't turn the cone, corner fast enough. It's all right because I'm telling you, they got new wine. Praise God. They got something going on inside of them. They need to hear. Thank God. And so it is. Thank God. I'm telling you, some of us have been drinking socially too long. Thank God, we need to get on a good Holy Ghost drunk. Praise God, we need to get the bottle and not get off of it till Monday morning. Praise God. You know, it just needs to get in your blood. It needs to get to flowing. Thank God, when the, you know, when the fallow ground people, thank God, realize, thank God, their sins have been forgiven. Thank God, I am going to get to go to heaven. I don't have a past in God's record book. Praise God, I'm going to be able to step into his presence with a clean slate. Thank God, look out. Thank God, they're going to have, thank God, their own way of just reaching and moving in the Holy Ghost. And I'm telling you, some of you need to go back to when you got the Holy Ghost and remind yourself, hey, I didn't act like this when I first got the Holy Ghost. I didn't just sit there like a bump on a pickle. I was really up a moving. I felt good. God was good. I couldn't help but praise him. Nobody could stop me. Praise God. Something's got to happen. Praise God. Something's got to happen. Something's got to happen. Oh, God, help us. Oh, help us tonight. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, people need to walk through those doors 
and feel like that, hey, these people are excited about being here. Thank God. Not just Paul. Praise God. I mean, we need the whole church to be excited about being in the house of God. Thank God. And especially when sinners are there. Thank God. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how dignified they are, how, how uh, humbly they may come. Thank God. It doesn't matter how they're dressed. Thank God. They're welcome here. Praise God. Because I'm telling you, if he can't clean them up, nobody can clean them up. So we'll just get them in and watch him do his work. But he can transform them. And so it's a beautiful thing. But I'm telling you, there is nothing that moves people like the power and the presence of God. I heard one of our preachers at one of the Lord's churches, you know, they had some dignitary come and they were, you know, they had this little lady. She would always cut a fit. She would always carry on in church and everything. And you know, that pastor, he knew they had this high official here and he just said, I hope a little sister you know, kind of holds it down. You know, we want to have a nice little service and everything. But they couldn't hold her down. She got loose. Thank God. But after church, that dignitary came up and he said, man, you know, it was a nice service. He said, but I want what that little lady had. Thank God. That's what I want. Thank God. I want whatever she had. That's what I want. I'm telling you, if they come here, they want something more than what they've been getting. Thank God. If all they're going to get is a dead, dry church, they can go somewhere else and get dead, dry church. So we don't want dead, dry church. We want a live church. Thank God. Look. Thank God we have the best thing this side of heaven. Praise God. The only thing better than this is heaven itself. Praise God. And so if you want to know what's as good as heaven, this is as good as heaven. We get to sit in heavenly places. Praise God. This is what heaven's going to be. Praising and worshiping God. If this gets on your nerves, if this bothers you, you probably don't want to go to heaven. Praise God. Because I'm telling you, it's going to be praise. It's going to be worship. It's going to be reaching and touching. Thank God. And the only thing that's going to matter is souls. Souls is the only thing that's going to matter on judgment day. It's not going to be what kind of car you drove. It's not going to be what kind of bank account you left behind. Thank God I'm telling you what's going to move heaven is how many souls did you touch? How many people did your life make a difference in? And I'm, I'm telling you, he only asked us to do one thing and that was to go and to sow. Praise God. And you just go and sow. He gives the increase. And so you say, well, I'm trying. If you're trying, if you're going and sowing, you're doing your part. Just keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Because I'm telling you, the right moment's going to come. The right day is going to come. Thank God. While we're standing tonight, it's time to break up the fallow ground. Thank God. Some of us need to break up our own selves. Praise God. But then there's some fallow ground out there that we need to everyone realize, hey, God gave me a plow. I'm going to get out here and I'm going to just start plowing. I'm going to start busting these ground, start busting up this hard surface, busting up this fallow ground, praise God, because I know somewhere down here, a seed's going to fall, and when that seed gets in there, it's going to change their life, it's going to be a beautiful thing, one day when God is able to do something with it, and I'm telling you, God is waiting on us, praise God, He's, he needs us to get involved in the harvest, it's like that farmer, you know, somebody came by and visited him, and he had this beautiful field out there. It was a beautiful crop. Thank God. And that guy said, man, God has been good to you. Thank God. He said, yeah, but you should have seen it when God had it by himself. Thank God. God's not going to plant the seeds. He's not going to water it. Thank God. But if you'll do it, he'll do something beautiful. He'll put you out a harvest like you never dreamed you would get. Thank God. It's time to break up the fallow ground. It's time to go into the highways and the byways and compel them. Thank God. Love them. Thank God. Get the word in them. Let them feel the power of God. Thank God. Some people, the only church they're going to ever see is you. Thank God. You need to go there and you need to be a light. You need to have something about you that when people see you, they say, hey, there's something different about you. I'm telling you, you ought to want to have that said about you every once in a while is, hey, you're a little different. Praise God. That's right. I am different. Thank God. Thank God. If you are here tonight, thank God, and you've never put on the wedding garment, I'm telling you, it's a wonderful thing. You can't understand, and sometimes you come into Pentecostal church and act, see them all acting out of character and out of control and whatever way you want to describe it, but I'm telling you, it's because one day we put on that wedding garment. And sometimes you think, well, I don't think it would affect me like that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. you get this wedding garment on, it's going to affect you. Oh, I, I would never act like that. Thank you. you get the wedding garment on. Thank you. you just see what's going to happen to you. Thank you. If you've never had it on, thank you. you owe it to yourself. Thank God. You know, used to, they would dare us. You know, I dare you to do this. I dare you to do that. Praise God. I'm telling you, I dare you to put on this garment. I dare you to put on this 
wedding garment, you'll be amazed at what happens to you. And God, I'm telling you, there are people sitting here tonight, and they will be the first to testify, hey, I wasn't able to overcome alcohol. I wasn't able to overcome this. But when I got that wedding garment on, praise God, something changed in me. Thank God, suddenly I was able to do things I never dreamed I would do. I walked by the bar and never even wanted to go in the bar. Thank God, what happened to you? I put on the wedding garment. Thank God. It's a gift. It's a gift from the king. Thank God. The king said, hey, go, go get them. I got plenty of garments. Thank God. We're going to put a wedding garment on. You just get them to the house of God. I can do the rest. Thank God. He purchased it with his love at Calvary. He purchased it with that costly blood. Thank God. That priceless, sinless blood. And so tonight you get something. Oh, it's not cheap. Thank God. I'm telling you, it costs heaven its best. Thank God. It costs divine blood. But the beautiful thing is, is it's for whosoever will tonight. He wants you to come. And all you have to do is to come. Repent of your sins. Thank God. And he'll give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why don't we sing a chorus? Thank God. Why don't you join us, church? Why don't we come on around? Some of us need some foul ground broken up. And if you're a guest here tonight, why don't you just come join us? Thank God. If you want to put on the wedding garment, there's plenty of them here. Thank God.